Welcome to Timeless Truth with Pastor Jim Thomas, a resource of the Village Chapel in Nashville, Tennessee. If you live in the Middle Tennessee area, every Wednesday starting February 4th from 12 to 12.45 p.m., we're hosting our next series of lunchtime talks at the Village Chapel. We'll be looking at the scriptures, studying several encounters with Jesus on his way to the cross. Lunch is provided and we encourage you to bring a coworker or friend. You can register at thevillagechapel.com slash events. This week on the podcast, we're continuing our study of the Gospel of Mark. Now, here's Pastor Jim. So today we come to the climactic ending of our three-part series in Mark chapter 13, talking today about the return of the Lord. Jesus had taken his disciples with him, gone over to the Mount of Olives, and he gave them some wise warnings, some major categories of signs and signals of the beginning of the end time, and of what they might expect to see some of it even in their own lifetime, as happens with much prophetic material in our Bible. Sometimes there's a near fulfillment, and sometimes the fulfillment is quite far in the distant future. But some of the things that Jesus talked about here in Mark 13 have already taken place. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, not one stone left on top of another in 70 AD. So Jesus' instructions to his disciples in Mark chapter 13 have already included things like, be on the alert, be on guard, take heed, don't be misled. He says it over and over again, and especially this one, my favorite one, don't be afraid. There are also words of hope here as we're reminded that there's a sovereign God who's in charge of human history and his plans and purposes will indeed be accomplished. Add to that, he even gives us some sense of telos or purpose uh, as we live and experience through uh, our, our, our way through some of the kinds of difficulties we have, each and every one of us in life, um, that there could be a testimony uh, that is reflected to those who are watching us and they can see or hear the gospel at work in our lives. Well, there yet remains one other event that will take place that Mark 13 talks about, and it is yet to be fulfilled, and that is the return of the King, the return of Jesus Christ to set the world to rights. Some Bible teachers have said that the second coming of Christ is mentioned 318 times in the 260 chapters of the New Testament. And this subject occupies uh, really every book of the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. Here's some of what the Bible has to say about the return of Christ. Mark 13, and I'll be reading uh, verses 24 to 37, okay? In those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. And here he's uh, quoting some from Isaiah. He'll also quote from Zechariah, both Old Testament prophets. Um, and he's uh, taking their, what they said so many years before and applying it to what has yet to come, even as Jesus stands on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. Um, he's, he's saying there is this far distant uh, fulfillment of what Isaiah and Zechariah talked about. And so the stars will be falling from heaven. The powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And that's not, that, that's not regular power and glory. That's great power and glory. And you can just imagine, um, or maybe you can't, but let that sink in a little bit so that it stirs your imagination a little bit. Um, and then he will send forth the angels and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest um, end of the heavens. So this is just comprehensive. It's total. And uh, he's in charge of it all. That's, that's really, really amazing, isn't it? Verse 28. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. Uh, 
When its branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near right at the door. Hmm. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place place. And what he means by generation there, there's been a lot of people speculate on that. Does he mean the the, the physical 40-year generation that's hearing him talk right now? Or is he talking about the generation or the era of the church? What's he talking about? Um, and you can explore some of that, as I've said, in some of the books that I've posted and listed. I'll do that. Um, I'll add that to the show notes for you. And if you want to look some of that up and, and chase some of that around. But for now, I just want to stay with what he is saying. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. That's massive right there. So if anybody comes along telling you they know when the return of the Lord is going to happen, um, you can know they disagree with Jesus right here, who very clearly in verse 32 says, of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, not even the son. In other words, Jesus himself is saying he doesn't even know, but the father alone. Hmm. And here comes that repeated exhortation in verse 33, take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his servants in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Wow. That's just, I keep hearing that word alert and stay awake and all that sort of thing. I think of all the times I've fallen asleep in church. Um, and I think I even almost fell asleep during one of my sermons when I was giving it. I mean, that's that's how easy it is to be lulled off into sleep. We need to remain alert and awake. Therefore, uh, verse 35 says, be on the alert. That's just in case you didn't hear him say it the first time and the second time, okay? Be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Uh, alert's one word. Be on the alert. Okay, there you go, man. That. That is amazing. Why? Because we don't know when he's coming. He's never late. He's never too early. He is always right on time. When is that time? I know so many of us will like to know. It's probably going to be 2 p.m. somewhere on the planet. Um, or if you were to say 2 o'clock, it's probably 2 a.m. or 2 p.m. Uh, in two different places on the planet. But um, the early Christians spoke often about the return of Christ, and many even anticipated that it would happen during their actual lifetime. When it did not, the apostle Peter, who, remember, I'm going to say he was right there on the Mount of Olives with Jesus in what we read in Mark chapter 13. Well, years and years and years later, when he writes his letters, we call them First and Second Peter, um, here's what he says in Second Peter chapter 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And then in verse 8, uh, and through 10, he says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but the Lord is long-suffering to us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. 
as a thief in the night. Wow. Well, back to the Mount of Olives, Mark chapter 13. Uh, Peter standing there and, and hearing all of this himself. Um, Jesus instructs his disciples to be watching and waiting for his return. Be on the alert. I, I lost count how many times Jesus said, be on the alert. Maybe you should go back and count that. I'll do it later myself. But here's a couple of just summary statements uh, for those of you that are curious about it, because I only have a few more minutes left. Um, number one, Christ has promised to return personally, visibly, and gloriously. All right, this will be in the show notes too. Um, Christ has promised to return personally, visibly, and gloriously. That is mind-blowing. That's amazing. Has it happened yet? No, it hasn't happened yet. Um, Could it happen anytime? Yes. Uh, I trust him. I believe him. He's been faithful and true all along the way. So someday, uh, one of those days that we measure, which is like a thousand years or a thousand years is like a day. In other words, to God, time is not uh, experienced the same way that we experience time. So if a day is as a thousand years, it's really only been two days since the Lord ascended back into heaven. (laughs) So 2,000 years. So he could come any time, any day. We don't know when. And Jesus emphasized that here in Mark chapter 13. We can't know when. Um, I'm going to stand right beside Jesus who said he doesn't know when. It's the Father that will um, give the go signal. So first, Christ has promised to return personally, visibly, and gloriously. All right. And that's the way you certainly would describe the way he describes his return here and elsewhere. Secondly, I'd say this. I think we should be more focused on preparing than predicting. So we should all remain watchful, steadfast, active in God's plans and purposes, all the while rejoicing with hope, preparing our hearts, busy in joining him in his kingdom mission. Um, He, for some reason, has given us this day to serve him this day, to go out and live out the gospel in word and in deed. What will we do with this moment that we still have before he returns? The fact of his return is more important than the timing or sequence of events preceding his return. We should spend more time preparing, less time worrying about predicting. That's number two. Number three, God is sovereign over everything, everywhere, in every moment of human history. That's a great summary statement uh, for all that we read here in Mark chapter 13. And a great thing to be reminded of over and over and over again. I grew up under the teaching of a man named A.W. Jackson. And he, uh, uh, at Cherrydale Baptist Church up in Arlington, Virginia, one thing that he reminded us over and over and over again is the sovereignty of God. This is where I personally learned uh, under his teaching the, the whole method of verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And sometimes, man, it felt like we were going really slow through Romans or Matthew or whatever it might be. And But now I look back on that and I say, oh man, I treasure that a rich well of of teaching that I received under the ministry of A.W. Jackson, who I remember to this day and who has influenced me and shaped him. And the Lord has used him in such powerful ways in my life and the life lives of, of countless others as well to remind us that God is sovereign over everything, everywhere, and every moment of human history, including when he um, decides it's time for that trumpet to blow and Jesus to return and set the world to rights. Number four, God's judgment will be righteous, certain, and sure, okay? Now, I'm excited about that, and I know there are a lot of folks who think that that's really weird that anybody would be excited about God's judgment, but I'm excited about God's judgment because of the nature of God. He's righteous, 
and his intent is to set the world to rights. In other words, everything that is wrong and broken in this world, he intends to set it right. That's why the book of Revelation is so powerful and so beautiful toward the end there, where it talks about him wiping away every tear, there being no more disease, no more death, no more dying, um, no more wars, no more rumors of wars. I mean, think about that when you think about the return of the Lord. As followers of Jesus, we can take courage in knowing that our hope is not anchored in the absence of uh, of tribulations in this world, but in the presence of our Savior, who is with us now, who abides with us now, and He holds us fast. Even if you let go today, He's still holding you fast, um, and we can trust Him even while we have to endure some of the tribulations that we must endure. A couple of quotes, and I'll let you go for the day. Here's from uh, the miss- miss- missiologist Leslie Newbigin. Some of you are familiar with him uh, from his book, The Household of God. The church is the pilgrim people of God. It is on the move, hastening to the ends of the earth to beseech all men to be reconciled to God and hastening to the end of time to meet its Lord, who will gather all into one. It cannot be understood rightly except in a perspective which is at once missionary and eschatological. Uh, those, If those words are foreign to you or a little difficult to understand, well, he, he actually defined them in the sentence before that. that That is, missional, that is, we are going to the ends of the earth to beseech all men to be reconciled to God, all people to be reconciled to God. That's the, we're going out to preach the gospel in word and in deed. And also, he says, we are eschatological. The church is eschatological, meaning uh, we're hastening all the way to the end of time to meet its Lord, who will gather all of us into one. We're eager for him to come, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yeah, we don't have a death wish. We have an eternal life wish. Uh, And it's for the Lord Jesus to come in glory and in power and to set things right in this broken world. What difference does the return of Christ make for you and and the promise of the return of Christ? I would say in four words, and, and there are many more that I could think of, but right now I'll give you these four. The difference that the promise and, and believing and trusting the promise of Jesus about his return, the difference that can make in your life is hope, security, purpose, and anticipation. Let me say those four words again. I'll put them in the show notes. Hope, security, purpose, and anticipation. If you need more of those four, they are yours as you trust in the promises of Jesus. Chuck Swindoll, um, one of the best Bible teachers the last, you know, several decades anyway, has a book called Hope Beyond the Culture. And we need a hope that goes beyond the culture, trust me. Um, He said this. It's It's a great book, by the way. I really encourage you to get it. If you live in light of Christ's return each day of your life, it does wonders for your perspective. (laughs) <laughs> Amen. Amen, Pastor Chuck Swindoll. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the promise of your return. Uh, renew um, our understanding of the, of the hope that is in that promise. Um, yes, Lord, help us uh, remind ourselves over and over again, even as we read our New Testament, see, help us to see those references when we run right past them sometimes uh, and, and, and don't pause for just a second and think about what it means that you intend to come back one day and set things right. We're so excited about that. It has filled us with hope for this day. Help us now to go live the gospel in word and in deed for your praise and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And God bless you. Have a great one. Thanks for listening to today's study. Take a moment to leave a review and share this episode with friends and family. You can stay connected by signing up for our newsletter or follow us on social media. At the Village Chapel, we believe God's word is unique in its source, timeless in its truth, broad in its reach, and transforming in its power. For more resources or to support our ministry, visit our website, thevillagechapel.com.